Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Hopefully you brought your Bible tonight because there's going to be a lot of Bible tonight. Um, so I'm going to take a moment to give attendance to reading here. Uh, we're going to read a few passages out of Isaiah 58, and then we're going to turn to another passage. And then I'll pray, and then we'll begin our sermon. So you're there in Isaiah 58. I'm going to start in verse 1. The Bible says, Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of their God, they ask, me, they ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, they say, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, ye, f ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is th not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, and that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out the soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Now let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. I'm going to read a few verses out of here too. In Jeremiah chapter 6, beginning in verse number 11. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. And from a prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fail or fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand thee in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Let's pray really quickly. Dear Lord, please thank, I thank you for everyone that can gather out tonight. I thank you for the Bible, your holy word. Please fill this church with your spirit tonight as we go over many great truths of the Bible and let all the saints understand and be edified by this great message that's about to be preached tonight. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in these two passages that we looked at here, I wanted to focus on the latter portion of each passage, particularly in Isaiah chapter 58, if you're still there, the, the verse 12, where it says, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repair of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. And the last verse in Jeremiah was, 
Thus saith the Lord, stand thee in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we'll not walk therein. And there's this passage, there's this phrase that comes up, the old paths. And you see in Isaiah, what was going on here was um, the, the nation at the time here in Isaiah, they were basically um, fasting out of hypocrisy and the message that we see toward the end here is, you know, go back to the old ways. You know, they had basically developed a new way, um, you know, hypocrisy via fasting. And th this phrase comes up, go back to, or yeah, go back to the old ways. And we see the same thing in uh, Jeremiah as well. And that's kind of the same message I want to give tonight about going back to the old ways. The title of my sermon is this. Old-fashioned Christianity still works today. Amen. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. Um, the fact is, this year... And just, you know, last few years, we've seen many paradigm shifts. We're always inundated with suggestions on new ways of doing things. And there's always just innovation going on. And this, this happens everywhere in the world. There's always, a bunch of, there's always a bunch of innovation and paradigm shifts. And things are always changing. And we see that whether we're in our workplaces or just in society or in politics, things always change. And something we see as well is, especially when it comes to our Christian faith, there's always suggestions on new ways of doing things. And what we need to ask is that if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as the Bible says, surely God has certain ways he wants us to do things. And just because something new comes in, it might not always mean that it's necessarily better. So it's best that we go back to the Bible and see what the Bible says about certain ways we live out our Christian faith and let that be ultimately what decides how we decide to live it out and ultimately looking at its fruit and allowing that to also determine if the ways we live out our Christian faith are the best ways. So the first thing, the first point I wanted to make, and you can turn to Acts 5, okay? Uh, title of the sermon is Old Fashioned Christianity Still Works. The first point I want to make is Old Fashioned Soul Winning Still Works, okay? Now, there's several people in this church that are out soul winning every week. We have a soul winning time right now on Thursday nights, and we have a soul winning time on Saturday morning. And this, when we go out soul winning, we're Obeying the, Lord, obeying the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he says in Mark, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I'm here to say tonight that those methods still work. Okay. Now, what's the new way? The new way is basically you just invite people to church and people will hopefully come to church and they'll hopefully hear a message where they can hear the gospel preached and, and they'll get saved that way. And unfortunately, that ultimately goes against what the Lord Jesus Christ commanded it when he commanded it in the Great Commission, which is in every gospel. Uh, Mark 16, 15 is probably the clearest one. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And you're there in Acts 5. I'm going to read a few verses here. Uh, beginning in verse 27, I'll read. It says, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we, not we straightly command you that ye shall not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Go down to verse 40. It says, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let him go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Verse 42 is what I want to focus on. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now, this is a very powerful story of the vision that was given for soul winning, giving the gospel to every creature following the commandment of Jesus Christ himself in the book of Acts. The uh, apostles, they, their testimony was they had filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. That's a pretty powerful testimony, okay? And th this wasn't just inviting people to church. They were going house to house, as we see in verse 42, and ceasing not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. And that still works today, okay? Now, you can turn to Acts 8. Um, while you're turning there, I'll just talk about how even last Thursday, here we are in our current year, 2,000 years after Christ died, about uh, Dakota and I went out soul winning last Thursday, and we were just following the commandment of Jesus Christ himself, going door to door, preaching the gospel to every creature. And you want to know what happened? Two people got saved. And how did that happen? Well, 
did we just invite them to church and say, hey, come to church on Sunday and you can hopefully get saved? No, that's, that's not what we did. We knocked on the door. We asked them if they wanted to hear the plan of salvation. They did. We showed from the Bible how they're a sinner. We showed them from the Bible how they ultimately deserve to go to hell. We showed them from the Bible how there's a free gift of salvation given by Jesus Christ. We explained how Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. We explained how he's uh, the Son of God, the Father. And we explained that salvation's offered to all that are willing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We explained eternal security, how you can never lose your salvation, how it's totally based on the death, the burial, and bodily resurrection of Christ, based on his works, not our own. And you know what? After hearing all that, they agreed. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They accepted they were a sinner. And they called upon the name of the Lord. And they were saved. And, you know, that still works. We don't need new, fa- we, we don't need new methods. The methods that we found in the Bible of going house to house, following the command of Christ to preach the gospel to every creature, that still works today. Now, you're there in Acts chapter 8. This is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, if you want to look at verse 26, that's where I'll start reading. It says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and say, said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now this is a great story, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. You see, the the eunuch was reading the book of Isaiah, Philip came up to him and he asked him, hey, do you understand what you're reading? He said, no. How can I accept some man should guide me? So, you know, Philip went ahead, obeyed the, gospel, obeyed the uh, command of Jesus Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He preached unto him Jesus. He got saved. Philip baptized him. And then, did he invite him to church and follow up with him for, forever? No. I mean, he, he, never, he no longer talked to him ever again. And actually, it wasn't just he decided to leave, but it says that, you know, the Lord caught him away. And, you know, that method worked in the book of Acts, and that method still works today, as evidenced by, you know, what happened last Thursday and what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, you know, ultimately, soul winning still works today, and these old-fashioned methods, although they've been working for a long time, the fact that they still work just shows how powerful they really are. It's almost like God knew what he was saying when he wanted us to go door-to-door preaching the gospel to every creature, following the commandment of Jesus Christ. So, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to read... A, verse out of Acts 20. This is Paul on his third missionary journey. He's speaking to the elders at the church of Ephesus. In verse 20, he says, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, and I've showed you, and I've taught you publicly, and from house to house. So, you know, Paul made it his mission to go house to house, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ to all people, and just following that command. And one thing I wanted to bring up here with this point is that one reason why just inviting people to church is faulty is because some people will never come to church, no matter how much you persuade them to do so. And I thought up a list of just a, a few quick reasons why someone might never come to church. And think of these type of people. Handicapped people, people that don't speak the English of the services 
the language of the services we have here, English, uh, young children or teenagers that we win to Christ that might not necessarily have a ride here. I, I understand that we have the bus ministry, but you know some churches are not that uh, thankful to have that ministry. Uh, maybe they live too far away. Maybe they're too shy to visit. Maybe they just already go to church somewhere else, or maybe they're just too lazy. You know, those are several, I think, very valid reasons why someone might never come to church. And the question is asked, how are we supposed to reach those people? Well, there's only one way, to go knock on the door and preach them the gospel. So, actually, if you want to just turn to Acts 20, we're going to look there in a second. So, what are we talking about tonight? Old-fashioned Christianity still works. Old-fashioned soul winning still works. The next point I want to make is this. An old-fashioned church service still works. You're there in Acts chapter 20. We're later on in uh, Paul's missionary journey here. Um, he said in verse 28, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Jesus Christ cared so much for the church that he purchased it with his own blood. He cares a lot about you, and he cares a lot about you know, the institution of the church and all the people that attend it. And today we're thinking, well, what's the new way that's, that, that we're hearing all about today? Life groups, okay? Now, at its core, there's nothing necessarily wrong with life groups, okay? I think it's great to fellowship with Christians. I think it's great to get together um, outside of church, and I think it's great to fellowship with fellow believers. But the institution of church, coming to church three times a week, I think is very important for our own spiritual development, for our own fellowship, and to be grounded in the truth. I mean, Jesus Christ thought it was enough, uh, it was worth enough to be uh, paid for with his own blood. So I think we ought to be thinking it with the same value. Okay. Now, I mean, just think about fellowshipping with people outside of church. My wife and I, we invite people to our home all the time to hang out, fellowship, play games, eat lunch, eat dinner. And, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. We thoroughly enjoy that. But you know what? I'm still going to go to church three times a week. I'm still going to go to the institution that Jesus Christ paid for. You know, Jesus Christ thought it was important. We ought to think it's important, too. So let's not forget about the institution of church, okay? Now, turn to Hebrews 10. Uh, we're going to look at a passage from there in a second. While you're turning there, I'm going to read a verse out of 1 Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy is about Paul talking to a young preacher named Timothy. Uh, he says, These things are right unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So one of the reasons why the institution of the church was created was to be a pillar and ground of the, of the truth. If you want to be grounded in your faith, if you want to be grounded in the doctrines of the Bible, if you want to be grounded in what you believe in, if you want to hear a, a certain set of preaching, you know, the local church is a great way to do that. And I think sometimes ways a lot of false doctrine can, can be brought in is when you're taking people from a large assembly and you're trying to just bring them in, bring them into your house, bring, bring them away from the, the main group and, you know, talk about doctrine and teach in that way. You know, I think that's a very vulnerable way to uh, bring false doctrine in. And so that's just something you have, you have to think about uh, when it comes to life groups. Again, there's, there's nothing wrong with fellowship with other believers, but don't replace the institution of church with it. Now, if they're in Hebrews 10, let's look at verse 24. It says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye, be, as ye see the day approaching. So if we want to change how much we go to church, this verse says we shouldn't have less church, we should actually have more church. And as the day approaches, as we see you know, times change and the, the end of the world get closer, we really ought to be having more church. And that's when that Christian fellowship as a group, being able to fellowship with like-minded believers, learn the Bible together, that's going to be more and more important as they approach So we can't forget the old-fashioned church service, okay? Now, we just went through an era, an era that began in early 2020, and it uh, looks like we're thankfully on the ending of this, but this was an era where a lot of people went through some issues with, you know, being able to attend church. You know, there were churches in several states where, you know, the, the government wanted to shut down the churches and make it impossible to attend services. And, you know, that was really a time where people, people got to feel what life would be like without the institution of church. And, you know, you can tell, you can look at stats where 
depression was going up, anxiety was going up, and all these crazy things going on because of the institution of church. You know, I think that's just another testament to the fact that the institution of church is so important, and we ought not just forego the institution of church for some new way. The old fashioned church service still works. Okay. Now turn to Ephesians chapter five. The sermon tonight is old fashioned Christianity still works. Old fashioned soul winning still works. An old fashioned church service still works. Next point I want to make is this. Old fashioned music still works. Okay. What's the new way? The new way is to get rid of the old hymns that people have been singing for hundreds of years. You know, there's, there's probably hymns in our hymnal that go back to the early 1700s probably. A whole bunch of them from the 1800s. But, you know, there's this movement to basically just get rid of the old hymns and we'll just, we'll just sing some, you know, Christian contemporary music. And I want to take a moment to just compare those two and see if that's a change that we really want to make. You're there in Ephesians chapter 5. The part of the chapter I want to focus on is in verse 18. It says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The fact is, with a lot of new music, that, that comes out today by these, by these rock bands and other Christian uh, music creators is that they appeal more to an emotional truth instead of Bible truth. And, you know, if you want to be in an experience where you just want to get a certain feeling emotionally, you know, you can have at it, but if you want to be grounded in certain theology, the old hymns are really good at that. And the old hymns have been really good at Bible truth, whereas a lot of the new stuff you see that's not really what they're focusing on. And a good way to test if you're going into an emotional experience with music is, if, if you ever see one of these bands perform, just watch what happens five to 10 seconds after a song begins. How often w does it happen where someone's immediately crying and they're, they're holding their hands up like this and, and everything? It, it's appealing to an emotional experience. You know, they're hoping to feel good instead of praising the Lord. And to prove this further, I'm going to just give an example, okay? One of my favorite hymns is this song, Verily, Verily. I have the lyrics right here, and I'm just going to just read it. And let's just uh, let the lyrics speak. The chorus is this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. He that believeth on the Son, tis true, hath everlasting life. And the verses go like this. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me. From condemnation he hath made me free. He that believeth on the Son, saith he, hath everlasting life. All my iniquities on him were laid. All my indebtedness by him was paid. All who believe on him, the Lord hath said, hath everlasting life. Though poor and needy, I can trust my Lord. Though weak and sinful, I believe his word. O glad message, every child of God, hath everlasting life. Though all unworthy, yet I will not doubt. For him that cometh, he will not cast out. He that believeth, O oh, the good news shout, hath everlasting life. Now, if you're growing up listening to songs like this in church that are just filled to the core with core Christian doctrine and Christian teaching, this song in particular, are you going to have any confusion about what it takes to be saved, what it takes to go to heaven, what it takes to have everlasting life? Are you going to have any confusion on eternal security? In the last stanza, it says, though all, though all unworthy, yet it will not doubt. For him that cometh, he will not cast out. There's your eternal security right there. And, and just the whole song, basically, is if you believe on the Son, you have everlasting life. Taking that right from John 3, 36, where it says, he that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The old hymns, they cater to Bible truth. And that's important. That's the spiritual song that we're looking for. That's the song that allows you to sing and make a melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, when I was in college, there was another song that was immensely popular. And all of my friends from college that were Christians, it seemed like they wanted to 
get me to enjoy this song, but I, for some reason, I, I just never did. I couldn't put my finger on it at the time, but I think I figured it out now. I have the lyrics here, too. It's called, and you've probably heard it, it's actually a really popular song. It's called 10,000 Reasons, Bless the Lord. It goes like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. And on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my song sings your praise unending 10,000 years and then forevermore. Now, is there anything particularly wrong with that song, the lyrics? I would say no. But the fact is, is that I, you, you can't really look at this and just see any just strong fundamental Christian doctrine in, in this music. Now, the way it's sung, you know, it's, it's a, if you're looking for a song where you can, you can really have an emotional experience where you're bringing in the rock band and you're uh, turning down or turning up the amplification on your microphone and s singing very sensually and having a very sensual experience, that's a perfect song to do that. But if you want to have the right spirit, the spirit that wants to give God all the glory, the old hymns, the old way that's been passed down to us is the way to do it. Okay. Now there's another song I want to talk about. It's called Nothing But the Blood. I have a good story about this one. Um, I used to live in Omaha, and I made quite a few friends there that were Christians that were like-minded. And every two weeks, I, I still go over to Omaha to go fellowship with them. We eat dinner together, cook some burgers, or do a, a, other fun stuff like that, and grill some food, and sing some hymns together, pray together. It's just a great time. And I was, I was asked recently because... I'm oftentimes a piano player. I'm not an expert piano player, but I can, I can play some of the songs in the hymnal. And I was asked why I oftentimes play the song Nothing But the Blood, because if you look at the song from a musicality standpoint, there's really not much to it. And I would agree. I'd say, you know what? If we're looking for an uh, experience that's just appealing to our emotions, you know what? There's, there's really not much to it. And as far as piano playing goes, any piano player in the audience, You'll know that song is extremely easy to play. It's extremely simple. Uh, there's really not much to it. But let's just re review what the lyrics are. The chorus is this. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And the verses are like this. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now from a musical standpoint, yeah, there's not much to it, but if you sing that song, you want to know one thing you're going to know? That salvation comes by the blood of Jesus. That nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you have kids and your kids grow up listening to that song, you want to know what they're going to know by the time they're teenagers without any confusion at all? They're going to know that nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And in a lot of this new music that you're seeing today, you just don't get that effect. So I guess ultimately I'll, I'll let you be the judge. Do you want to grow up knowing strong Christian doctrine, or do you want to just cater to an emotional experience? One more point I want to make about, about music, and if you can, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Another point I want to make about a lot of this new Christian music, you might be asking, why is it so vague? I think there's a pretty good answer, and the answer is this. A lot of this new Christian music doesn't have a spirit of wanting people to really understand Christian doctrine, but it's rather a spirit of, let's sell as many copies as we can to make a lot of money. Because the reason why is this. If you have vague doctrine that just 
makes mention of God and says good things about God. Pretty much anyone that names the name of a God can buy it. You know, if you think of the song 10,000 Reasons that I read out, sure, a Baptist could sing it and there'd be nothing wrong with it. What if a Catholic sang it? Would people be batting an eye at them for singing that song? No. What if a Methodist sang it? What, a, what if a Mormon sang it? What if a JW sang it? What if a Muslim sang it? Would anyone be batting an eye at them? No, because as far as, as, far as they're concerned, they're not saying anything wrong. But how about this? You know, nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Will you see a Muslim or a Catholic or a Mormon or a JW singing something like that? It's probably not going to happen. So people don't want to come out with new Christian music if they want to make money. They're, they're going to have a problem. You're there in 1 Timothy. Uh, again, Paul's talking to a young preacher. Timothy, about in the context here, he's telling him about being happy with the basic essentials. In verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We have the option. Why not just sing the most spiritual music available? One other thing we have to consider when we consider music is the source. Now, a, f a few years ago, I, I, I crossed paths with, with, with this name. This is the name of a new Christian music artist. Y you may have heard his name, maybe not, but his name is Michael Gungor. I he heard about him in college, heard about him afterward. He's, a, he's one of these new Christian music producers. He produced Christian music, he gained a large following on uh, his Christian music, and a lot of people that were excited to hear. He gained a lot of fans. A couple years later, a news article came out. I want to just read it. Christian musicians Michael and Lisa Gungor, members of the Dove Award-winning band Gungor, made headlines this week with their denial of the inerrancy of Scripture in Genesis. Then, Michael Gungor declared in a clarifying blog post, no reasonable person takes the entire Bible completely literally. He goes on to say, Do I believe that God literally drowned every, human, every living creature 5,000 years ago in a global flood, except the ones who are living in a big boat? No, I don't. Why don't I? Because of science and rational thought. But he still makes good music, right? <laughs> you know, when you're considering what music to listen to, you have to consider the source. And thankfully... When you, look our, when you look in our hymnal, you see a lot of hymns written in there by spirit-filled Christians who knew what they were talking about, and it's evidenced by the doctrine in the songs that they write. And that's a good source that we ought to be singing from. The band Gungor, that's a bad source. If it's a bad source, you can expect bad fruit. Uh, Michael Gungor went on to say the following regarding the blood of Christ. That God needed to be appeased with blood is not beautiful, it's horrific. He, he's denying the blood atonement of Christ. In this church, we believe that nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And this guy wants to say that it's horrific, the idea that you would need blood to uh, remit, remit sins. But he's still a good singer, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter four. Old-fashioned Christianity still works. Old-fashioned soul winning still works. An old-fashioned church service still works. Old-fashioned music still works. My next point is this. An old-fashioned Bible still works. What's the new way? The last few years or decades, we've been inundated with new Bible versions. For over 400 years, the King James Bible has been available. It's been studied faithfully by God's people. We specifically read from the King James Bible in this church, and we have convictions about that. But what's the new way to go to one of these newer versions? They say it's, it's newer, it's easier to read, it's, some, it's nicer to look at, the words are more majestic. We'll, we'll get to the word majestic in a second, but... What do, we, what do we ought to do? Go to the new way or stay with the old way? You're there in Hebrews chapter 4. Let's read verse 12. The Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So it says here in Hebrews 4 regarding the Word of God that it's quick, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And if you've looked at any number of passages from one of these newer Bibles, like the NIV or the ESV or something like that, you'll notice pretty quickly that those adjectives describing it, quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, they really don't apply. You know, the King James Bible is truly a two-edged sword. And if you've read it, you'll know it. But these modern Bibles just are not like that. They're basically like an annual butter knife, okay? You don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to read a couple other passages. Now, Psalm 29, 4 says, The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And in John chapter 10, this is Jesus speaking, saying, it says in verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. The idea is that the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd, and the sheep do not hear the voice of counterfeits. The fact is that the NIV and these modern Bibles, they claim to be newer and better, but the fact is they lack power. Now, there's a lot of other things they lack too, but this is not a sermon on that. But when it comes to the Bible, you need to examine the fruit. Okay? It says that the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd. You know, the fact is, if you look at a lot of people that, that say they read the NIV or you go to churches that primarily read out the NIV or the ESV or one of these other modern versions, what you notice pretty quickly is that there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of people that haven't even decided to read the Bible at all. And, you know, when you have a Bible version that just lacks power, it's a butter knife, ultimately that's going to happen. And, you know, I even would go as far as say I, I'd have trouble trusting a preacher that faithfully reads the NIV and just says it's the best book of all time because it, it said in John 10 that the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd and of thieves and robbers the sheep do not hear. So if you're reading the NIV time and time again over the years and you just say it, it's just a, a great voice of the shepherd, all I can really say is you must have a different shepherd than I do. That's just what it comes down to. Okay. Now, I mean, even... Even the New York Times came out with an article recently talking about uh, the literary dynamics of the King James Bible. Even the secular world knows that the King James Bible is what has power, okay? And over 400 years, King James Bible has been out, and you can just see the fruit of it. I've compiled a list of things that often happen when you have a church that preaches out of the King James Bible. You have congregants that actually read the Bible, Oddly enough, in a lot of these other churches where they don't read out of the King James, the congregants are not reading the Bible at all. They might read a verse here and there or have like a morning devotion, but as far as actual study time, they're not actually doing it. A church that reads out of the King James Bible oftentimes will have a soul winning program. They oftentimes will have hard preaching where they're actually preaching truths of the Bible that the congregants and the saints of the congregation need to hear. Not just something that will tickle their ears, but something that they need to hear. The church I preached out of the King James Bible will have Christians that are not confused on Bible doctrines. How often is it today that you see that Christians are confused on the fundamentals of the faith? I can't count how many times I've seen Christians that are confused on the doctrine of salvation. Probably the most basic Christian doctrine there is, and Christians are confused on it. I'd say it's probably because a lot of these modern Bibles have something to do with that. They confuse the message so much. You know, look at the fruit of the King James Bible. Churches that have reading out of the King James Bible, they have lots of involvement in these other ministries. You know, not only soul winning, but you have a bus ministry, you have prayer breakfasts, you have alternative fellowships. You have a lot of that when you have a church that reads out the King James Bible. How about this? A church will meet three services a week oftentimes if they read out the King James Bible. Why? Because if they find the Bible important, they find the preaching of the Bible important, and they find the message of the Bible important, and they desire that. So you'll have services three times a week. And you also have higher Christian standards as well. That's just what happens when you have the King James Bible. Now, that's been going on for 400 years. It, you know, I would just go back to this old saying. 
If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We don't need a new Bible version. Although there's a lot of other reasons why you should not read modern versions. You know, that's on the sermon tonight, but the King James Bible works. There's no reason to change it. Now, if you can, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. What's the sermon tonight? Old-fashioned Christianity still works. Old-fashioned soul winning still works. Old-fashioned church services still work. Old-fashioned music still works, and an old-fashioned Bible still works. The next point I'd like to make is this. Old-fashioned truths still work. When it comes to this point specifically, this point, what I wanted to focus in on was the doctrine of hell. Because there's confusion about what hell really is, and there's a modern push to change how we teach about hell. You're there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's read verse 8. It says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, if you can turn to Revelation chapter 14. While you're turning there, I'll say is that, you know, in, in this passage, it says, flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says that this is happening in the presence of the Lord. Now, you ask, what's the new way? The new way is to avoid this idea that hell is a place of fiery torment that goes on eternally and just teach that hell is separation from God. And the idea behind this is that you don't want to scare people with a Bible doctrine. You want to just tickle their ears and just say, well, separation from God, we're not going to teach about fire or torment or that it's everlasting. We'll, we'll just teach that it's separation from God. But you know what was interesting is that when we read in 2 Thessalonians, it said that they're punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. So, I mean, is that even true? <laughs> You're there in Revelation 14. Uh, we'll read verse 10. The Bible says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. These are talking with people that have taken the mark of the beast in Revelation, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. What's the new way? The new way is to avoid talking about how hell is an eternal place of fiery torment. And that place of fiery torment will be given to everyone that has not placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that message is so important to teach today. And today what people want to say is they want to say, well, you don't want to scare them. But it, have you pondered this? If you scare people with the doctrine of hell, you might scare them into getting saved. I think, that's what, I think that's what we want. You know, we want people to be saved. And don't be ashamed of Bible doctrines. And, and this is definitely not one Bible doctrine you don't be ashamed of. You know, people today, what they want to say is, don't teach about the fiery torments of hell. Just teach about that separation from God. But from these two verses, I mean, that's not even true. So not only would you be teaching not the full truth, but you wouldn't actually be teaching the truth of all. Because it says that, you know, the, the Lord is present. You know, David wrote in the 139th Psalm, he said, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. So, you know, he's everywhere. And if you think about it, unsaved people, you tell them that they'd be separated from God in hell, they're not going to care. They don't want to even believe on Lord Jesus Christ. They wouldn't even mind being separated from him. So, I mean, it, it's ultimately a great point that you're just throwing away by accepting this new way. You know, the old-fashioned truths still work, and there are a lot of people out there that are saved because they did not want to go to hell. I mean, I would even go as far as saying that's the primary reason why people get saved, because the sanctification, living a new life in Christ, comes later. Okay. Now, if you can, turn to Romans chapter 12. This will be my last point. What's the sermon tonight? Old-fashioned Christianity still works. An old-fashioned Bible still works. Old-fashioned truths still work. Old-fashioned music still works. An old-fashioned church service still works. An old-fashioned soul winning still works. My last point is this. Old-fashioned standards still work. You're there in uh, Romans chapter 12. The Bible says in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable 
and perfect will of God. Ultimately, when someone has standards, what they're saying is they want to be the person that meets what we just read in Romans 12, verse 2. And what's the new way? The new way is to say, well, we're under grace. There's nothing else we need to think about. And you know what? If a person has a time in their life where they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they've called upon the name of the Lord, and they don't do anything else, will they still go to heaven? Absolutely. The Bible's very clear on that. But you know what? The, the, the fact is, is that God can use us for a lot of things, and there's a lot of people in each of our lives that we can reach that no one else can. And God can use experiences that we have with people in our lives, and I would say don't waste that. That is very important, and there's a lot of things that we can do to help people grow spiritually, go out getting people saved. You don't want to lose that. You don't turn there, but I'll, I'll read another passage out of Colossians chapter 3. Uh, in verse 1 it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. A person that has standards in their life, that's ultimately what they're doing, is they're fulfilling that verse. They want to set their affections on things above. And what are, what are some standards that anyone can have? How about having a standard to uh, read your Bible through a certain amount of times a year? How about you just reading your Bible through once a year? I think that's a worthy goal for anyone to have. Amen. It's something you can accomplish by just reading it 15 minutes a day. And you'll gain so much new knowledge out of the Bible just by doing something as simple as that. How about attending church three times a week? You know, people say church once a week is enough. I personally don't think it's enough. Three times a week is probably the minimum because, you know, the Bible's a big book and the fellowship you get with other Christians at church is phenomenal. How, how about this standard of teaching your family the Bible? If you're a parent teaching your children the Bible, that's a good standard to have. Teaching them the Bible and sing with them the great hymns of the faith so they'll grow up knowing good Christian doctrine and they won't be confused. You know, I, I find it interesting how we have standards for other years in our life. If we're an employee, we have standards for what we're looking for in a job, how many hours we work a week, how much we're going to get paid, what kind, of, what kind of work we do. We have standards for how we're going to raise our children. We have standards for what friends we want to have. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I guess I'd ask the question, why is it that when someone has standards on how they live their spiritual life or how they live their Christian life? Why do people want to just quickly say that we're under grace? I mean, the fact is, we all have gifts that we can use to enrich the kingdom of God and to grow it. And I would say, don't waste that. So, what's the sermon tonight? Old-fashioned Christianity still works. Old-fashioned soul winning still works. If you've never gone out soul winning before, or you haven't gone for a long time, there's a soul winning time tomorrow. You can meet at 7 p.m. You can talk to, talk to Aaron about it. He'd be happy to give you the location and other details. You can be a silent partner. You've never gone soul before. You're, you're scared to go. Be a silent partner. And you can just go with someone who knows what they're doing, who can hold their own at the door. You won't have to say a single thing. You can learn a life skill that has eternal value. An old-fashioned church service still works. Jesus Christ died for it. Don't give up on it. Old-fashioned music still works. We've been blessed to have loads of music that, was, that were written by spirit-filled Christians with loads of Christian doctrine that will prevent us from being confused. You know, if, if you raise your family to listen to God's kind of music that's full of Christian doctrine, a friend of mine put it as theology put to music, which is ultimately what it is, you won't, you won't be confused. The old paths. An old-fashioned Bible still works. King James Bible has been around for 400 years. It's still respected by everybody. Even by non-Christians, it's respected as a literary figure. It's respected for just how it's written. Why change it? It's not broken. Old-fashioned truths still work. There's no reason to dumb down the message. In fact, preaching the truths of the Bible will come across as better as trying to preach phony stuff anyway. And old-fashioned standards still work. Again, the Lord has plans for our own personal lives. And we all have our own spiritual life. 
that we can attain to. And we all have our network of people that we can witness to and we can help sanctify. And after they're saved, we can, you know, if they're friends, we can invite them to church and we can help enrich their own spiritual lives. We don't want to waste that. And, you know, let's just be thankful tonight that we have the old paths. The fact that we don't have to figure out a lot of the stuff because a lot of what we've been given has worked. And in the midst of a culture where everything tries to get, where everything tries to be changed, we can know old fashioned Christianity still works. Amen. So I'll close there. If everyone wants to stand, we'll pray and dismiss the service.